Welcome. You're listening to Living Faith Podcast. Starry sky and see your hand in time in mind to lead me through the night. First things first, what tops your list? Before I get started, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm pretty excited. This weekend is the first weekend of our Purpose Institute campus taking place here in the greater Seattle metro area. Uh, last night was our first course, about three hours, had students from all over the metro area gathering together, studying biblical leadership and service and ministry. It was a great turnout, wonderful group. And then today, starting at 9 o'clock this morning, in fact, we've got a handful of folks there right now. What? They're missing church? Oh, no. Rather than my 30-minute sermon, they're going to be part of seven hours of biblical coursework. They're getting plenty of church. This morning, they spent a couple hours on the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Right now, they're entering into a class. It'll start in the next few minutes uh, regarding the Pentecostal doctrine. What do we believe and teach based on Scripture? What are the fundamentals? And this afternoon, they're going to look at apostolic action in the book of Acts and what takes place in the church based on the book of Acts. I'm pretty excited about it, not just for the benefit to our congregation and those students who attend and grow and deepen. In a, really, it's a fast-track discipleship. It just is cramming a lot of material in a short amount of time. Going to benefit our church, our area churches, but in the future it's going to benefit our neighborhoods and our ministry and our impact here in the great Northwest. I'm very excited about Purpose Institute. If it crosses your mind, pray for the campus and the students. They meet once a month for four weekends, four months, four weekends in the spring, and then four weekends in the fall. So very excited about Purpose Institute. What tops your list? First things. What do you do first? In fact, it was in a break last night. Between sessions, I was talking to a student at Purpose Institute. And we were just talking about ordering our lives. He said, listen, talk, tell me, what do you do? How do you put your days together? He said, from the time you get up in the morning till the evening, how do you do that? He said, you, you, you mentioned something about phone calls. What time of day do you make phone calls? And just picking my brain about ordering life. Situations that we're in, and when I was talking to that uh, young man, I said, you know what? It became apparent in a point in time in my life when I had more things to do than my memory could keep track of. Came a point in my life, just could not remember everything anymore. And for each of us, those are different times in our lives. Perhaps it's why you're still uh, in grade school. You start organizing and straightening things out. And hopefully parents are helping their children to self-organize rather than doing it all for them. Who can I get a witness? Get into high school, perhaps, or get into college and recognize you got too many things. Get into your first job or into a greater position in your job, and there's more things going on than you can remember, and you got to organize. Where do you start? Well, they say you eat an elephant one bite at a time, but you could still say, where do I take that first bite? How do we organize our lives? How hard are we trying to organize our lives? Are we living every day intentionally with purpose? Do we uh, appreciate that our time, that our energies are limited? They're not never-ending. Do we appreciate that there are some things more important to others? And how do we decide which things are more important? This, this practice of prioritizing is not unique to discipleship and following Christ. It's a frequent topic of leadership. It's a necessary topic in time management. At times in our lives, we could default to just, you know what, I got so much to do, I'm just going to do something. It's better than doing nothing. I'm just going to start. I'm going to do something. I see Brother Rich smiling over here. I was asking him how his workload was going one day. He said, whack-a-mole, whack-a-mole. 
that game that's in the arcades and you got a hammer and just whenever mole jump, whack a mole. That's what was going on. You, I got to get something done. I got to take care of something. There are things that are pressing. I've got to complete a task. Sometimes we choose the things that are simplest. You ever done that? You got a whole list of things and you're like, well, what's simplest? I just want to feel successful for a moment. <laughs> you do something simple. Sometimes we do the things that we like the most. Of all the list of things we got to do, well, you know, I, I like this one. I'm going to do that one right there. And sometimes we address things because they're urgent. And sometimes we tackle things because they're most important. And there are times you got a nice plan for the day and something happens to wreck the plan, right? It's the way life plays out. Emergencies, accidents, sick people, unexpected phone calls. I think it's safe to say that in the sound of my voice here online, some of us are great at prioritizing and others are on the other end of that spectrum. Most of us probably fall somewhere in between. And even wherever we are on that spectrum of successfully prioritizing and ordering our daily tasks and actions, there are days when we're really good at what we do, and there are days when our best laid plans just fall apart. First things first. What tops your list? In 1989, there was a, a novel released. Actually, the author is a Nobel Prize winning author, Kazo Ijuguro. And the book was entitled, The Remains of the Day. The main character of that book, his name is Stevens. He's an English butler, and he's got a long record of service to a Lord Darlington. And he serves at this stately home in Oxford, England. The setting begins in 1956, where Stephen takes a road trip, and he's going to visit a former colleague from those days that he served Lord Darlington. And he starts reminiscing about... 30 years ago when he was there serving and working in that role. And as the story unfolds in the remains of the day, there are, are two themes that start to come to the front. One, the man that Stevens had served so faithfully for decades, Lord Darlington. As it turns out, it appears there in Oxford, England, this man was a Nazi sympathizer. The other thing that becomes evident is that Stevens was in love with Miss Kenton, a co-worker from those 25, 30 years ago. And so on this journey, on this trek, he begins to reflect back on his actions of these previous details. And he thinks about the man he served, Lord Darlington, and his character and reputation. He thinks about his relationship with Miss Kenton, and he reviews all these things. And on his journey, he meets a fellow traveler, and they have a conversation. He shares the things that are going on, and he begins to recognize the lost opportunities in his life. See, he, he, he never asked Miss Kenton out to dinner. He never invited her to coffee. He never pursued that relationship. He let it go. They went their separate ways, and she married someone else. And he recognizes that the man he served all those years of being loyal, all those years of doing his very best, was probably somebody whose morals and whose uh, loyalties he did not approve of. And so as he's talking to somebody else, he appears to have taken all this together, and now here he is in the sunset years of his life, and he meets a fellow traveler, and the traveler says, Well... I guess you're going to need to just focus on the remains of the day. 30 years, nothing you can do about. Missed opportunities, nothing you can do about. Consider just what's left of your life at this point. You know, many of us look back on our lives and they say hindsight is 2020 vision. And perhaps when we look back, we think, you know, I'd like to have done better at that. I'd like to handle that differently. I, I wish I'd have gone this way or that way. Uh, yet 
Few live today. We don't live our lives saying, you know what I hope? I hope that at the end of my life, my, I will crash and burn and be a total failure. We don't live our lives saying, you know what? At the end of my life, I hope that I'll just have boatloads of regrets. Nobody looks at that in their right mind and right course. Of course, we are in a crazy area. But to think, you know what? At the end of my life, you know what I want to do? I want to spend my eternity in hell. Oh, well, people want good things. We want to enjoy good things. We want to enjoy benefits. I want to have nice things happen. I, I want to see good things. I want to live with a smile on my face. I, I'd like to get to my golden years and be able to look back and say, you know what, this has been a wonderful life. But some end up stuck with the remains of the day. Now in this series, First Things... Today, I'm just going to really establish the groundwork. But we're going to examine various areas of our lives. And I want to help us to take a careful look at the future and a careful look at right now and offer ways we can better choose the first things in our lives. Of course, our prescribed method of evaluation to follow Christ is his word. Disciples begin with the word of God. Look with me. Notice Exodus chapter 23, verses 14 to 16. I want you to see some feasts that are revealed in this passage. Scripture says in 23, 14, three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat the unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Beeb. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. Verse 16, and the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. Three feasts, these were called by the Lord to happen during the year. Three national assemblies. And, and these were called pilgrimage festivals. The people made a journey to where the Lord invited everyone to go. Typically, it was in Jerusalem, had to do with the tabernacle, the temple, but it was a place of gathering. Three times a year, everyone from the surrounding areas, followers of God, his people, made a journey to celebrate this feast, to acknowledge the Lord for specific things and specific times, at specific times. Happened regularly. He wanted these things practiced. He wanted to remember their purpose. So they were often engaging themselves in the cycle of the Lord's blessing. Three feasts. Deliverance, inheritance, and ingathering. Feast of unleavened bread was deliverance, Feast of the harvest or weeks or first fruits was inheritance and the ingathering at the end of the season. They were to remind Israel, you know what, Israel? You need to appreciate where you are today. You need to appreciate what you enjoy today. And you need to remember this very, very important fact about the children of God living in the inheritance of God. You've been involved but you're not responsible. The Lord intended for Israel to know. You're, you're participants in what's going on and in your circumstance, but you didn't provide for these blessings. You, as a people of God, are recipients of the blessings, not originators of the blessings. And so there were these repeated feasts, year after year after year. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, you come early in the year, spring, right? Where we talk about Easter time. And then the next feast was seven weeks later. That would be the Feast of the Harvest, or sometimes called Pentecost, or sometimes called First Fruits. And that feast would be May or June is when that would take place. 
And then later on in the year, September or October, we're talking about the growing season, so it had a little fluctuation, would be the feast of the ingathering. Year after year, these happened. And here's what that solidified in God's people during those decades of following the feast. It caused them to reflect like this, Psalm 24 and 1. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. After year after year after year of celebrating, I'm out of Egypt because of God. I'm delivered and free because of God. Next feast, I'm enjoying this land because it was given to me by God. And it's producing some fruit because He is the Lord of the harvest. And at the end of the year, look at all the bounty and look at all we've brought in and gathered in from this year's harvest. It is because of the the Lord. And that understanding got into people's minds. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Psalm 89 and verse 11, another passage. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world in all its fullness, for you have founded them. It's not just an Old Testament concept. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul quotes to that church and reminds them, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Got these three national assemblies. Everyone gathers together, makes a trek to the designated place three times a year. They'd ingrained this truth into the hearts and minds of God's people. So the first feast happens in March sometime. Unleavened bread happened in conjunction with the Passover. And the purpose is to remember the Lord's deliverance from Israel, or excuse me, from Egypt. You got to remember, God rescued them from bondage. In those days, people confessed, I'm free because of God. He brought me out. He spared me. We are here and delivered because he acted miraculously. They didn't just up and gather together on their own and put together teams and make up our armaments and then decide to bust out of there. It was a miraculous hand of God that delivered them. That's the first festival, Unleavened Bread, happens in about March. Then at the end, there's another festival. It's called In Gathering. That's the third festival. It's also known as the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Shelters. It took place when the harvest was completed. They've cleared out all the fields from all the variables and everything that's brought in for the year. Everything's done with the harvest. It's completed, and now the bounty is collected. And in September or October, they would get together. And this had a specific purpose as well. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 15, the Scripture records about this feast. Seven days, keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which He chooses because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you surely rejoice. Why are we getting together now at the end of the year? Because God will bless you in everything, all, your, all the work of your hands, and you'll be rejoicing at it. And so at the season's conclusions, people gather to celebrate He is a divine provider. Look at all the ways that God has blessed Israel. Look at what the Lord has done. That, that was the third festival. They gathered together for that. And everybody looked for that. As I said earlier, we, we want good outcomes in our lives. We want good things to happen. Nobody says, you know what, I want to work all of my life and then end up a pauper. Nobody plans for that. We want good things. We want best things. We want prosperous things. That, that third feast, everybody's looking forward to that. But in between, in between the unleavened bread and the in gathering. <coughs> in about May or June is a feast that acknowledges that indeed he is the first fruits. 
This important feast is integral through the progression. You don't just go from unleavened bread and deliverance right into bountiful blessings in September and October. There's a May and June in between there. And in May and June, this feast occurs. It reminds people that their land, harvest is just starting. You know, crops blossom and are due to mature at different times through the season. So the, the first one's coming in. If I read right, it's probably that wheat that was happening. And so the first thing they're going to do is be able to make some bread. That, that first crop comes in early in the season, and they have a feast. And they have a feast to say, you know what, here's what I'm acknowledging. I've got land to farm because this is my gift from God. This is my inheritance from the Lord. I've got land to farm. Furthermore, this produce that is coming forth, it didn't come because of the pagan gods of other nations and other lands. This came forward because of the Lord God Almighty. He is Lord of the harvest. So now they're living. This is the gift of God. They live in a new land, in a new territory. The blessings in Canaan are not related to Egypt. The blessings there aren't the results of someone there. The blessings in Canaan don't follow Egyptian practices. In Canaan, they didn't farm the way they farmed in Egypt. And the expectations aren't based on just personal labor like they were in Egypt, but on the promises of the Lord of the harvest. And so throughout this growing season, they gave their very first at... Now look at Deuteronomy 26 and verse 1. I'm going to read a few more verses here just to get the setting of this middle feast. It shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance... And you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground which you bring from your land that the Lord your God is giving you. Put it in a basket, go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. Verse 3, you shall go to the one who is priest in those days and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the country which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. See, they're, they're recognizing I'm in this land because of God. I got a place to farm and to benefit because of God. Verse 4, the priest shall take the basket out of your hand, set it down before the altar of your God. He shall answer and say before the Lord your God, My father was a Syrian about to perish. He went down to Egypt, dwelt there few in number. Then he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid hard bondage on us. Verse 7, And we cried out to the Lord God of our fathers. The Lord heard our voice, looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. So the Lord, verse 8, brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, with great terror, with signs and wonders. He's brought us to this place. Given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now, verse 10, behold, I brought the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. Then you set it before the Lord and worship before the Lord your God. So you shall rejoice in every good thing. So you're going to hear that again later. In every good thing which the Lord your God has given you and your house, you and the Levite and the stranger who is among you. I, I like that passage because it's a real nice summary of the progression. Now, I'm not in Egypt anymore because of divine action. And I get to live in freedom and have a farm and have goods and be able to have my needs supplied because God gave me this land. <coughs> And farming works and my land is benefited and profited because God gave the increase. He is the Lord of the harvest. As Evan preached last week about the exodus, that, that previous status was Egypt. They were mistreated. They were afflicted. There was hard bondage. And now they're out. They're blessed. They're free. They're farming. They're shepherding. How did that happen? Because of the Lord. Credit belonged to the Lord. And so how did they respond? 
They worship before the Lord. They rejoice before the Lord. They brought to him the first things from their harvest. First fruits was a practice that illustrated their beliefs. So that whatever they brought, probably wheat, is a tangible proof. You know what? I'm letting the Lord know. You know why I have this? Because we possess the land that you gave me. They were indebted to the Lord. They confessed that he and his people, that the priest and the people owed their existence to God. They're aware that the blessing is because of God. The first things festival was saying this. All that I have originated from God. The Lord gave Israel the Canaan land. Yeah, they fought the battles. I'm aware of that. But God gave them the victory. The people were involved, but God was victorious. The Lord gave Israel the crops and the herds. Yes, they were farming. They were shepherding. They participated in what was going on. But the Lord is the one who gave them the increase. All that Israel inherited, everything was provided by the Lord. And so that sincere belief is primary. It's fundamental, if you will, to you and I that would enjoy the benefits of the kingdom of God. First things, what tops our list, the, the, the core of how we order our existence, how we order our abilities and our talents and our blessings and the things that are happening in our life. The core is to confess He is my provider. Where I am today is because of the Lord of glory. As the psalmist summed it up, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. That fundamental thought. <coughs> now both the Lord and the people, they took these festivals serious. They took their convictions and practices serious. They were serious about this. In fact, I think it's interesting in Le Leviticus 23 and verse 14, it's talking about that second feast, the feast of the harvest, or sometimes called Pentecost, or first fruits, first things. It says this, you shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Here's how serious they were about acknowledging God in the, in the first elements of their blessing. They first start bringing in the harvest. They got some grain. They can make some bread. But I'm not eating a sandwich. Until we honor God first. If it's a garden and there's some vegetables coming, I'm not making, I'm not making a salad and having it until I honor God first. Until I make a declaration, you know what, I'm going to take a portion of this and I'm going to honor God. I don't need to take all of it, but I'm going to take a portion of this and say, Lord, I recognize but before I even have a sandwich. But once I've honored you, then I'll start partaking of the land. But first, I want to note it that you are the source of my blessings. It was offering before consumption. God, God, you know what God said? He's not requesting the remains of the day. He's saying, you know what? If you'll just give me what's left. If anything remains. First things means priority. I want us to appreciate the trust, feast of the harvest, and first things illustrates. Harvest season starts coming in from May and runs into September. First fruits are offered in May. Let me ask you this in our little area alone. Once you see the weather in the first week of May, can you predict the weather for the following weeks until September? 
You got no idea how it's going to play out. It might be heavy rainfall followed by beautiful sun. It might be all sun scorching things away. It might be... You with me? In May, there is no valid prediction of how it's going to play out in September. And yet, in this harvest middle feast, in this middle festival, the children of Israel, the people of God said, you know what? I'm going to honor God. I'm going to bring him an offering. I'm going to tell him that I, he is in charge because I, I know what's going to happen in the future. But right here at the beginning, I'm going to plan on God. I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to give to him. I'm going to invest in him before I even know the outcome. How could they do that? Because they were convinced that the Lord is deed is the Lord of the harvest. I, I can't make things grow, but God can. I can't make things be bountiful, but God can. I can't control the weather, but He can. <coughs> we truly believe He's our provider. Then we trust Him with the, the first things. Top of the list. In our lives. Just as Israel did in May before they knew the outcome. That, that requires a leap of faith. The scripture says the Lord rewards that kind of trust. In Proverbs chapter 3, notice what it begins in verse 9. Honor, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats overflow with new wine. So the biblical process is the Lord gives, gratefully we acknowledge and return a portion of that first things to him and then the Lord gives again. Now, that's an unusual process because Israel has spent so much time in Egypt and it didn't work that way in Egypt. But now they live in a new land. They live in Canaan. And things are different here. Now, you've probably picked up on it. It's a bright group. These passages clearly talk about financial gain. And yes, in this series, there'll be a portion of one message that I'll talk about returning tithe and giving offerings financially to the Lord. But, but that's only a part of what is the ingathering of God's blessings. Proverbs said, honor the Lord with your possessions, with the first fruits of all your increase. All your increase. Honor God with the first portion of all your increase. Now, let me just provoke you a little bit if I haven't already. Are finances the only way you increase in your life? Or are there other avenues, other things, other developments and growths and increase that have happened in you and who you are and what you've become that is also more, it's better, it's improved from what it was prior? How about our increase in our intelligence and in our understanding? Are we, are we more understanding than we were a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago? In what ways is that understanding being honored by the first things in our priority list? How about our increase in our social skills and our social abilities, our conversational abilities? How about our increase in our spirituality and our depth in our relationship with the kingdom of God? I, I, I'll go back to Deuteronomy 16, 15. This is talking about the festival of the harvest, the festival of first things. Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses. Because the Lord will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you surely rejoice. I love that. The Lord's blessings 
will surely make us rejoice. There's nobody saying, oh, man, God is blessing me again. There's nobody saying that. Surely it is rejoicing to be blessed by God. All, it says, all the work of your hands. Deuteronomy 26, 11 says, So you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given you in your house. Every good thing the Lord has provided. Again, I offer, does the Lord provide fa financially? Yes, money's part of God's blessing. But is that everything? Well, not for me. God is blessed in so many ways. The Lord will bless all the work of your hands. Rejoice in every good thing. There's so much more involved. And now that God's people are out of Egypt, they're in Canaan, they're in kingdom of God operations, now we trust the Lord to divinely bless in multiple areas of our lives. Hear me today. We start out recognizing in that unleavened bread, He's delivered me from an old way of carnality. He's delivered me from a, a way of just humanity and of sinful nature. And he's brought me into a new land. And in that new land, he's promised me there's going to be a fall coming. There's going to be a September and October where there is bountiful produce coming ahead. <coughs> and in between there... In the middle of there, I'm going to recognize and understand that where I am is because of the things of God. But when I look to that end result, understand there are multiple areas for God to bless and for God to bring blessing. His deliverance, His inheritance, His provision, it is all part of His plan and His trust. We can look forward to the hand of God working in our lives. Yeah, in Egypt, they possessed land. In Egypt, they farmed. In Egypt, there were harvests, there were crops, there were fields. But in the new land, inheritance and planting and harvesting and bounty are acts of God. And in Canaan, the people of God are no longer dependent on Egyptian taskmasters who only... Return enough to ask for more. Make more bricks. That's the request of the Egyptian taskmaster. But here in Canaan, God's people have the privilege of placing their trust, their confidence in the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of the harvest. Our present and our future rests in his divine provision. And because of that, I want us to grasp a little bit today and appreciate. And if God will help me, we'll see more of that in the messages in the weeks to come. But to take this understanding, you know what? I am not looking down the road for a merely human harvest. I am not looking into the September and October of my kingdom life and thinking, uh, I hope I get as much corn uh, as the folks who don't know God. Uh, I hope I get as much blessing uh, as the people who are unaware of the Lord. No, I'm looking for God results. Uh, I'm looking for a God outcome. I'm looking for a God harvest. And so we, the people of God, we can join with the psalmist. In Psalm 85 and verse 12, it records this. Yes, <coughs> the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Increase. I, I want to encourage and inspire disciples today. That final feast, that in gathering is the Lord's bounty. And we make it into the Lord's bounty and the Lord's blessing. There are no regrets. When we trust that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, it's not going to end up in a remains of the day kind of moment. We rejoice in every good thing the Lord gives every good thing. <coughs> Would you stand with me? <coughs> God.
God's blessings. God's blessings. I want to encourage somebody that as we look into the future, we're looking for his blessing. Things that we live in right now, we are benefited to say, Lord, I thank you for all you've done and all you've given. We're benefited to remember each and every day. I, I am different. I am changed. I have understanding I didn't have before because God brought me from a long way off. He's responsible. I'm a recipient. Do I participate? Yeah, I do. But I'm not the cause. I'm not the originator. I'm not the uh, in initializer of these things. It's him and his blessings and his goodness. So where are we going with this? Well, in the Gospel of Luke, it records that Jesus, when he was 12 years old, we really get his birth. We get a little story about being 12. And then we get when he's 30 years old and launches into ministry. But when he's 12, the scripture Luke records that Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God, and with all the people. There was increase and development. That, I think it's important that word increased. That Jesus increased in his development in these various ways. And in the coming ways, I want to explore in the coming weeks, explore those increases and how we can best apply first things. How can we live in this present time, in this May, June time of the feast of God's blessings? I've, I've been delivered from Egypt. I, I'm in this middle time looking for God's blessings and bounty in the future. How can I live? How can I choose first things? so that I end up enjoying God's blessings in all the days ahead. Would you ask the Lord just to minister in our minds and spirits with what we've heard today and what we'll hear in the weeks ahead? Would you join with me, wonderful Savior? Lord God Almighty, we are thankful for your blessing and your goodness. We are thankful, Lord, for the power of your word. We're thankful, Lord, for the principles laid out by even the practices of those, Lord, when you first initiated relationship in the Old Testament. We thank you, Lord, for deliverance. We thank you, Lord, for inheritance. And we thank you, Lord, that you are the great provider of blessed bounty in the years and the days ahead. I pray, Lord, that you would allow this understanding to begin, Lord, to marinate in our minds and spirits from today. Let it carry us through this week and bring us back again next week. And help me, O oh Lord, to communicate from your word what you are interested in as we prioritize our lives, what tops our list. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Can you say amen? You've been listening to the Living Faith Everett podcast series. Tune in next week for the next part of this series, or join us online at livingfaithministries.church.